Hi, folks. Welcome to an episode of North American Deer Talk. Today we have owner operator of Powder Ridge Outfitters, Jared Berry. Jared, welcome to the show. Hi, everyone. So, Jared and I were off script here a couple minutes ago. We were talking about um, broken legs and animals, and it was. Uh, we were just sharing some op observations. I, I thought it'd be interesting to to go into some of our personal experiences with uh, broken legs, and um, you know, kind of the the differences in, in what we see, and kind of how all animals and all situations are are a little bit different. I know that uh, I've had, especially in fawns. You know, you hear a lot of a lot of people say like, "Oh, you know, I I got a fawn. Don't don't touch it. It'll heal fine." and um, and that, I think that may be the case I've seen where, um, I remember I had this doe fawn. I want to say she was like two months old. Of course, you know, they're two months old. They're real, they're real active, but she was bottle fed. And, um, I ended up, I ended up splinting her, but I took, I took like a three quarter inch, uh, schedule 40 PVC and I like sanded and rounded all the edges. And I made this, this splint and I caused up that bottom of, it was a back, I think it was a back leg uh, in between the knee and the, the hoof. And uh, just, I put that, I put that gauze on and then I sandwiched the two pieces of PVC around that, around that bone. And it was a, I mean, it was a full, it was a full break. And then I just put, uh, you know, like horse wrap or vet wrap around it and then kind of duct taped the seam so she couldn't chew it off. And um, I think I left it on for a week week or two and uh pulled it off and you can kind of see the skin was broke um you can kind of see like the the um area where it was broke it was still it was clean but you know there's a little a little bit of pus out of there and then i put it on for another two weeks and when i took it off it wasn't solid but like i didn't need to put anything back on like it was it was fused um i thought after four weeks it's pretty incredible to watch um you know, bone kind of heal that fast on a, on an animal. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, on, on fawns like that, the same, there's, there's two, two animals in my breeding operations that come to mind. And the one was a, uh, it was a bottle raised doe fawn mm -hmm. and, uh, we had transitioned them from around our handling barn out into the pen, whatever that was, late July, something like, I can't remember. This was, this was one of the first years we were at our Holidaysburg location. And um, she uh, running around like crazy. Whatever happened, happened. It was a compound fracture, like you said. And I'm sure you and I were consulting back at that point too, with back and forth, but I did a very similar thing. But I mean, that thing was compound, broke. I mean, I, I didn't know what her chances were. And about every uh, 10 days, two weeks, probably less than two weeks, I would uh, uh, take it off, check it, you know, clean it, everything up, rebandage it. And I think about after three times of that, we were able to uh, take it off and, and, and she was, she ended up being fine. I mean, she was a doe that we bred for years. Um, but like you said, it was less than a month and she was back, you know, on it. A, a funny story, like, you know, the inside of our handling barn out here, this would have had to have been 2009 or 10 and our barn was just a barn with a concrete floor we didn't we were in a process of that fall of installing what is now our, our handling facility so i had uh i had um like two i had straw bales set on top of one another just to box her in mm. and I actually put it by one of the windows and i'd be out with the other fawns that we were when, when we still were bottle feeding back then um, bottle raising our doe fawns and she'd jump up on the window like a dog and you could just <laughs> see her looking at us from the from the first pen right. but she became that that whole process probably made her the most tame uh, female we probably ever had Interesting. Um, just one of those ones you uh, don't even have to worry about you know or, or you'd have to worry about but she was that dog tame that you really couldn't work her you just had to walk her down to the barn if right. you were gonna you know do AI or whatnot you know she's one of those deer in the runway, you just, you just run past her and come back for her later. Yeah, they can be a but, pain in the ass trying to get them in the in the barn. Those ones that yeah. do circles circles around you, 
Um, I think I think one of the, the biggest things that I found is when uh, like when the skins broke open, uh, it's not so much the casting, it's the cleanliness, and and you know having yeah. that that gauze wrap and then the PVC seal with you know some more gauze padding and then the vet wrap you know keeps all the dirt and shit out of there and that's I think that's as important as the stability that the that the splint provides. Um, I know I've done some soft casts, you know, where you just kind of wrap gauze and, and uh, you know, padding around there and then take that, that vet wrap and go around it. When I say vet wrap, you know, if you go into like uh, tractor supply or, or something like that, you know, you got those little, um, it looks like uh, a Spanish, but one side's sticky, you know, they use them on, I guess in horses. Yeah. Um, I don't have any horses, so I just use them on deer. But uh, yeah, it uh, it works really good. Um, the only the only thing that I did find is you got to make sure that like you're floating this happy medium of how tight you wrap it. Because um, if you wrap it too tight and cut off that blood flow, that's a bad thing, obviously. And um, you know those because it's pretty bony, especially from knee joint down. There's not. A not a bunch of muscle and stuff there. Um, you wrap it too tight, all those those blood vessels sit on the outside. She, she I've had two other broken legs. Um, one specifically I remember distinctly because it was one of the second year we were raising deer and it was one of our bucks that we were backing up our AI program with. He was pretty important to us and he, um, a learning mistake, but you know, I darted him and the dart hit low in his back hind, hind leg and he went to push off of that leg and just snapped it um, right above his his uh, back joint there, the, yeah. the knee, not the knee, yeah, the knee joint. Up, <coughs> up high, closer to his thigh, <coughs> excuse me, closer to his thigh. And um, we, you, you see people asking quite often on, you know, some of the social media pages, you know, a deer has a broke leg, what do I do? Um, and I guess my general experience just with what I've done is if it's not a compound fracture, I've generally let it go. We let him go. And within a couple months, he was back walking on it. Um, and, uh, so it, it I think it, it definitely messed up his rack because that was, uh, March or April, uh, when this happened. Um, and, uh, so he went, you know, he wasn't worried about that. I was just worried about him surviving, but Generally, if it's not a compound fracture, I've let let it go, especially on young animals. Right. Um, I don't think they have a problem uh, healing as long as, you know, they have space. They're not getting picked on. They're not, you know, all those, you know, giving them uh, maybe separating them is a good idea. But I've I've never had to do that either. But um, obviously, if you have high high hurt or high densities in your pens or something like that, it might be good to to move them out and give them a little bit of space or move them with lesser deer you know something right. of that nature but compounds though i mean i've uh definitely i think they should be knocked down and looked at yeah infection especially warm season right it's uh it's it's kind of interesting you know i think that um you know just like every every de every deer has a story if you will um you know making making decisions on what to do with animals is is and can be challenging. Um, I think I've I've transitioned away from trying to save every animal um, just because it doesn't make business sense. And I think that it would be good for a, for a lot of folks to kind of um, take a step back and look through a different lens. Um, I've seen I've seen where people, you know, they have a buck that's a year and a half old that gets a you know a, a break above the knee joint, you know, maybe up into the upper leg or the hip and they amputate it. And I just think to myself, why, you know, the buck, you know, his, his value, obviously that, that deer is most likely not going to be a breeder. Um, you know, aside from it being a pet, which I guess is okay. Um, you know, on a, on a, but I mean, on a breeding operation, like that deer doesn't have the value that it, it once did. And if, if anything, it's just going to cost you money. 
I mean, you do an amputation on a rear leg, you know, you're probably looking at a few hundred bucks for a quorum call and a few hundred bucks to take the leg off and then any additional, you know, meds and upkeep on that animal. And then there might be special things you have to do. So, you know, for me, I'm not, I'm not interested in, in, in putting anything into my animals outside of, you know, feed and vaccine really, um, to, to keep them alive and healthy. Like I just, that doesn't, that doesn't factor into, to my business plan. And I, I think if, if folks would look at that through that lens, we'd see a lot less deer with, you know, a, a rear leg chopped off or something like that. I just, that's no, I think when, I, when I see that, it just kind of, it's cringe to me, but whatever. I think your last point, uh, mentioning your business plan, I think that, that obviously plays into those decisions. Um, a valuable breeder buck that guys are selling semen out of, I can understand the, uh, the, you know, wanting to keep that animal alive and healthy beyond that, uh, you know, um, I don't want to sound harsh then, it, then, then to your point of raising pets and it, you know, you're doing it because it's a pet and you want to, you know, keep it around for your own reasons, you know, but, uh, I, I generally would agree with you. I'm either going to let that animal try and heal on its own. And if that starts to go, in a direction that's you know it's not improving then the animals called i mean it's just yeah it's gotta it's, it's gotta be um yeah. you know in in addition to the the upkeep cost of that animal you know there's certainly space and then yeah. you gotta worry about this safety of that animal especially a buck you know yeah. where do you keep them do you keep them in with the other deer well yeah. he's gonna get pounded in the in the winter you know, so you have what build a new pen for him, or I don't, I don't know. It just again, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, it, it, usually, if a buck's going to break a leg in October, November, you're not going to find him in time to save his leg anyway, because he'll yeah. probably be dead. Yeah, you know, sure. just for sure. The way it is. Yeah, as soon as, the, as soon as those deer show weakness, man, those other bucks. Are yep. Brutal. Yep. Even some of the does, they get aggressive, or they can. Right. right. Um. I was thinking, uh, I remember, I forget what year it was. I don't know, 04, 05, 06. Um, I remember um, Russ Walk telling me, you know, about Loner busting his leg. And, you know, they had the vet in and they pinned him and screws and all this other stuff. And he was healing. And, you know, he was such a, a big bodied animal that I guess when he, he was like trying to breed again that that fall, he freaking got s s yeah, stuck humping a doe or something like that and broke that leg and they ended up, you know, having to put him down. But that uh, certainly that was a different time, but like that, that's a great example of a, you know, a buck that had a lot of value, um, you know, semen was bringing really good money, offspring, et cetera, where it was worth, you know, spending a couple thousand bucks to do whatever you had to do to, to make him, make him good. And, um, I just think the market has changed a lot since that time. So anyway, um, I was curious. I lost you a little bit. There might be a head in your sound. I, I'm, I can still hear you, dude. We're, we're okay. good. We're you were good. just, you were just fading out. I don't know if they're going to hear it on the, on the podcast or not. That's okay. Um, I was, uh, I was thinking about, uh, you know, winter, winter management. And I started doing these, these, uh, quick little Instagram videos called the daily ramble, where I just talk about nonsense in the, in the deer farm. And, uh, I was, I was thinking about like weather and then animal health slash sickness, however you want to look at it and then like pastures and you know for i i think we've been fortunate this year at least in my opinion where i am you know we got a pile of snow we got way over two foot of snow uh in one dump and every i mean we're still covered that was a month ago or whatever three weeks ago and we're still we still got six inches of snow out there easy um and it's been cold relatively speaking, you know, we're not getting too far over freezing and um, it's been getting down, you know, sub freezing into the twenties and maybe the teens at night. And when I look at, 
when I look at like weather long term and I say, okay, weather uh, potentially can be a driver of uh, sickness if it's extreme in whatever cases um, or a trigger for, you know, potential issues with my animals. Um, I can look out and that snow cover and those temperatures, they give me a sense of peace, if you will, um, for, for more of like a long-term look. So like I looked at the weather here a couple weeks ago, two weeks ago, a week ago, whatever it was. And it was just like 30s during the day, 20s at night, and really no precipitation. And which, you know, weathermen and pollsters, they went to the same college. But like, I, <laughs> I, um, I thought that um, I thought that that would be an interesting thing to to look at. You know, if that's something that like, do you, do you look at the weather? You just wake up and you're like, okay, it's sunny out. I'm going to go do some work. Or do you? I mean, do you bother kind of looking at that? Uh, I look at it in a sense that it gives me, um, like what you're explaining, would give me a little bit of peace and calm as far as it sounds consistent. Um, as far as for example, you got snow in the last, we're, for those who don't know, we're probably, what are we, two hours apart? You're yep. about two hours northeast of me. Yep. Um, we, I haven't been thrilled with my patterns because when you got snow last, we were getting pounded with rain. Mm. Um, we don't have, I mean, we have spotty snows on some of our northern slopes and that type of thing, but uh, you know, my pens are generally bare now, mm. um, bare, bare of snow. And um, and then we've been getting these like tw high twenties, low thirty nights with high thirties, low forty days, and um, which I don't mind that so much if it's dry. But when then it comes with rain, then it comes with twenty degree nights. Um, you know, I started to see a little bit of issues in my animals, uh, especially my younger animals. Um, issues, I mean, by like one or two animals starting to show signs of, you know, not. Uh, looking like something's you know going wrong and I, I directly contribute I contribute a lot of that to the, the weather patterns we've seen in the last two or three weeks um, more so though uh, kind of you know I sent you a te we, we text all the time quite often I should say we um, I sent you a text the other week to do a podcast on um, you know just the theme of managing for these worst case scenarios um, so when they do come you're ready for it. You're not scrambling to do whatever it is you think you have to do or worst case, which I, I am not a big, I don't do as much of it anymore is uh, having to worry about getting darts ready and treating fawns with antibiotics and all the things that go along with that. Um, that uh, I don't have good luck with that. You know, I'd rather be ahead of the game trying to figure out, you know, pen densities or is there open pens that are a little better conditioned that you can move animals in before you see these patterns come in, you know, do you have enough shelters if they're even going to use the shelters? Do you, you know, just all the things that come along. And I think a lot of it does deal with densities, um, which we've been discussing, you know, personally one-on-one, -on -one. but, uh, it, uh, yeah, it, I, I look at weather in a sense of here's, here's the shitty weather. Here's the crappy weather. Am I prepared for it? You know? And, you know, I think your animals will tell you pretty quickly if you are or you're not, um, in, in the general scheme of things. Yeah, the uh, I think back to that pen density topic. You know, all these things are kind of intertwined. You know, there's not like one without the other. You know, they all kind of touch on each other. So, like, you can get into nutrition, you can get into pasture management, pen densities, and they all just they're all interwoven. You know, it's all um, pieces of a pie. The I. I keep coming back to this place where um, you can, you, you gotta have number one, less animals than you think is even appropriate. And you gotta have space. You know, these, even if you, I think even if you have the space, the, you can't, I don't, I don't think it's good to run lots of numbers. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I don't really know. I don't run, I don't run, you know, 50 deer in one pen because I don't have a farm that size. 
I know that you've had more experience than I have with um, having larger groups of animals. So, um, you know, putting 20 or 30 bucks in a, in a pasture for a summer, you know, do you see, I don't know, let's, let's call it a hypothetical. If you had 30 bucks and they were on, I don't know, five acres, right? Do you think that those 30 bucks divided into three different groups would have less issues in one and a half acre pens, right? So is it easier to manage smaller groups of animals from a health standpoint on the same space, but the density per, maybe, that, maybe not the density, but the total number of animals would be less? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's a good question. I, 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 to your point of densities, I mean, I, I think we, but I'm going to use myself. I haven't been on enough operations to maybe see that there's a way that guys can run uh, a higher number of animals per acre than I would even ever consider and, and, and do it successfully. Um, well, does generally does speaking, equal you know, bottles of Duraxin? Maybe, yeah. So, and how much? Okay. How much time do you have? Someone, you know, how much time do you have to spend in those pens every day to be constantly treating them with antibiotics? And then, what's that doing to your animals long term? I mean, I, I was just thinking. Yeah, there's a cost associated with that. There's cost, and it, and is there, it, and not just monetarily, potentially, not just money wise. Mm -hmm. um, there could be costs to the health of that animal looking long term if that's an animal you're trying to keep long term. Um, I've been, uh, I've shot two darts of antibiotics probably in the last six months. Mm, um, and I'm, how many, now, how many animals I've, are you I've, running? Say that again. How many animals are you running? Uh, I'd have to read, you know, with moving some animals this fall and whatnot. 200? No, I'm probably in that 125. Gotcha. To one, one thirty here, yep. and then another twenty five thirty at another facility. Yep. Uh, but uh, that's pretty good. Two darts. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I lost, I lost a couple deer. I lost two deer um, sure. in the last six months. But, uh, but if I go back three years ago, uh, my densities were, generally speaking, probably twice what they are now. Wow. And and the, uh, well, I should. I, I should rephrase that. My, my pen densities with my yearlings, my fawns from this past year going into winter, were probably double what they are now. Right. And, um, and I still have some work to do on, on, on my numbers and figuring out, you know, where the, where everything's, where everything kind of works the best. Um, but back then, it, it was hell. I mean, I might as well have been, I had to, I had to, bottle of antibiotics in my Kubota that we, you know, worked do all our work with around the farm and a dart gun there constantly. Isn't that crazy um, to think about? That's no fun. It's no fun for me. It's obviously no fun for the animals. And then you're trying to dart a deer causing more stress on the rest of the animals in that pen that are already being exposed to probably something um, that's, that's attacked or coming after their immune system. So um, I think people think that's the norm. The bottle, the bottle of meds in the, in the Ranger or the Kubota. With a dark, yeah, man. I, I, uh, I, 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 you're probably right. I mean, I you see it too often where it's, um, it's a short term. What do I do about this? We'll hit them with, you know, people, you know, two cc's of this, three cc's of that, blah, 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 blah. And it's yeah. like, and then, you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't know everyone's farm, but, uh, I think so much can be changed with densities, but then you start having that density discussion. Even my dad and I having that discussion, you know, there's a, there's, you have to be willing to learn constantly because there's, there's a business model that you obviously are trying to, you have a certain amount of cost, you need a certain amount of income to make, to make things work. Um, when you realize that your original numbers were almost twice what they probably can be on your farm for your farm to be or, the most profitable. Yeah, to be yeah, to be <laughs> to be truly profitable or be more profitable. Um, you know, things got to change, and you got to work out how that works. But I, I think um, 
there's a bounce there where you're being profitable and you're not being profitable. Um, and I think densities as a whole, not speaking there, there's individuals that I'm sure that manage 10 times better than, than I could right now. But, uh, I sure am trying to make it better for my animals. That way I'm not sitting here spending a couple thousand dollars a year on antibiotics. Like, come on, you know, um, it's yeah. just not where I want to where I want to take our herd or our animals. You know, I'm I'm less animals, more productivity. Um, which guys, like, what the hell does that mean? But like, you know, if I can only raise 25 mature three or three year old bucks on this place, and that's where it tells me I can. Well, my it, my farm's telling me, in a sense, as I learn, what I can and can't do with it. Um, I don't. Where we, I guess we're just we said we're just going to ramble about this, you yeah, know, yeah. For this kind of stuff. But I, it's your question of one and a half acres. I, I like. I have, uh, I have currently have three buck pens, uh, what I consider my, my pens for my, my bucks that are a year old or over. And, uh, my, I have one that's just shy of four acres and one that's around five acres. Um, then I have another a two and a half acre pen and I would much rather take the five acre pen than the one and a half acre pen or, or the three, one and a half acres. Um, there's a, there's there's multiple reasons you know i don't like to interact with those animals a lot a lot of those animals are going to eventually enter into our our hunting preserve mm -hmm. um so i'm not you know not sitting there throwing them treats not sitting there you know i'm going in there take a ride around the ranger binoculars make sure i see everybody make sure everybody looks healthy or i feed them and i back off a couple hundred yards and i watch the feeders and they all come up um that type of thing um that's how i like to manage my buck pens i but to your point if i had one and a half acres um going to your example uh i still think you can accomplish the same goals you just need to you know whatever that is eight or ten bucks or six or eight bucks in that one and a half acre yep. um but I, I like the big pens i think i think there's a uh you know i'm trying to build a, a an additional my goal is to get five acres into an additional uh holding pen or you know, a buck pen um and i'm gonna try that again i don't i don't I just think there's a uh, is there a, like a compounding factor to giving them space? Uh, you know, six bucks per acre on five acres, like we said, uh, yeah. thirty bucks in five acres. That's still quite a bit. Um, That's a lot of bucks. They yeah. You get a couple but, boys. You get a couple boys in the pen. They start acting a fool. Yeah. But, yeah. but uh, no, the, you know, I never mix. I never mix those deer. My my goal, I was telling you, is. Uh, you know, to have those deer in a pen, maybe two years max, and then they're getting it's introduced into our preserve. It's an age class of yep. Yeah. Yep, and then it's going to get six to nine months in the growing season off mm -hmm. with you no know, animals on it. Gives me time to interseed, lime, fertilize, whatever I have, whatever that pen needs. Um, you know, that that goes into a whole different rotation, having space. I mean, I don't, I don't see many deer farms now. I know a couple guys that are that you and I both know that have enough pen space to move animals quite often uh, i get not quite often um they have the ability every four to six months to say okay let's move this group of does over into an empty pen that's been empty for six months or mm -hmm. recovered um i'd like to get to that point i have a couple pens i leave open that, that i can uh move but i would love to have more of that ability to do so especially times like you're talking about if i let a pen um recover in a sense where say it's it's uh that's that it's a whole different stuff. I'm going off on a tangent, but um, right. I, uh, the ability to move animals into fresh pens is, is nice. That's, that's the theme of it. You know, I think about, I think about like winter and like these animals just kind of dumping crap everywhere and peeing all over the place. And, you know, here in Pennsylvania, the ground's frozen for lack of a better term. And that stuff just sits on the surface and without snow to cover it, and we have, you know, there's some residual vegetation there that it can kind of filter down through some of the grass and stuff. But, you know, those ho those hoofs are like scissors, you know, and you get freeze thaw, freeze thaw, freeze thaw. And once you get some frost in the ground and the top, you know, the sun opens up, depending on how your, your pastures are set up and the sun opens up and you have this, you know, top inch of the, the ground that thaws each day those scissors, those hoofs going in the ground are like clip, 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 clip. And they, they take out your vegetation without, you know, your vegetation cover without snow. 
also there's there's no like that fecal material doesn't break down there's no there's no photosynthesis happening where it's being absorbed into the ground and those those uh grasses and whatever are taking up that that fertilizer if you will and so i i look at that and i say okay well you know these these guys right they might have some extra pens you know the, our numbers generally speaking my numbers right now are the lowest that they are all year i'm at the bottom of the barrel so like i'm calculating out my pen space my pens number of deer i have age class trying to strategically place them and, and utilize my facility the best i can but what happens you know in july and august when i've just added 25 more animals to my farm you know people are like oh they're just fawns yeah they're just fawns with no immune system most susceptible to bacteria yes so you know it's it's a challenge what is your i i, I and i'm just thinking about this now because i haven't like said this to myself before but the carrying capacity of your ground needs to be calculated differently for winter and for summer, I think. And I think it, it would be an interesting conversation to have um, as we kind of thought about that more in detail of what that looks like for those types of things. And, and are there certain, is there maybe some management techniques that you can kind of flow your inventory a little better um, based off of how you set up your pens um you know overall yeah, i uh -oh. think the I, no no the, the idea of uh it's not continuous grazing but like if you're in cattle you'll hear continuous grazing on pasture so those cat those, those animals are on that pasture 24 7 365 days a year i think that is uh, highly detrimental when you start when you change that animal to to uh to a deer um in, in the in a in the uh, livestock production side of what we're talking about our industry with, with the raising deer the uh, i you talk about you, you just made i wrote it down because you said it but you said it like residual vegetation you yeah. know when when you look at your, your your vegetation in your pen now i i don't look at and i see some guys who have pens that they can let animals in that have clover this and you know a nice mix of highly palatable legitimate food sources that'll help your animals along that i um i'm jealous when i see that but you, you've you been to my facility i'm, I'm up high on the ridges I, I i'm just looking for a ground cover i'm not looking for too much of a nutritional got, benefit got a little rock to my, there do you yeah a little bit <laughs> But we're, we can we we can grow good pastures, but I think um, uh, it takes it takes management. And I'm look and when I look at what you said, residual vegetation on my ground cover, um, two or three weeks. What are we in now? Two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, I um I took about <clears throat> eighty percent. Uh, one of my breeder pens, I had a buck with uh, like four, fourteen does, um, and I moved. Uh, nine of those does out of there into a one and a quarter acre pen that hasn't had animals in for over a year mm. um, well, for at least at least since at least since last March so yeah. at least the whole growing season yeah. I mowed that pen one time this summer and I did it early I don't know what it was probably June July and I have mainly orchard grass in my uh, in my pens here and um so I had, going into the fall, I had orchard grass that was 8, 10, 12 inches tall. Now it's fallen over, but it create, it created, it's created this, I'm going to say it created this insulation in a sense, yep. where I, the pen that the, the breeding pen these girls was in was about an acre and a half. Um, and it was a little high in density, but just for the two, three months of breeding. But just the separation of taking the, the, these nine, nine girls moving them into a fresh pen like that you if you're around your animals you can just sense that it's like a sigh of relief to them because number one the pen they were in is getting beat up a little bit because i had a higher density and it, it, to me it's comparable to betting on um they're either gonna be betting on cold ground because it's been it still has grass cover but it's chewed down to your point it's beat down so they're basically laying on uh 
flat, cold surface. Then they go up here and, and they're betting in uh, eight to 10 inches of pack, pack not pack down, but, you know, mm -hmm. of grass. There's got to be, and I'm not, I, I didn't do any measurements, but there's got to be a, um, a temperature difference. Sure. Just in, in where they're betting. You well, know, it's a, it's it, a comfort it's, thing too, right? Yeah, I mean, they all say, obviously have more space, but um, it, it's just, to me, it was so telling that I need more of this. I need to be able to do this with every pen of animals. Now, that might, that's that would be ideal. I don't think that's sure. a reality right now. But if I could increase that by 50% of what I have now to be able to move three or four groups, let some pens recover, move, and move um, more often than I would have ever thought, maybe, maybe a pen gets used... I, once every six months not every pen but certain pens um and that's just the management I, I i try and come up with plans and then i realize the plan has a flaw and then you adjust that plan and it's kind of like uh I, I guess it's just an active management but it's, it's more just trying to pay attention i catch myself i catch myself sometimes not paying enough attention to what's going on and at that point it's usually too late you lost the farm you're like no shit there's there's 10 fawns in this half eight, half acre pen Yep. Or, or whatever that is. And I'm like, man, I should have four fawns in this half acre pen and, and probably wouldn't have any issues. You know? Same, same with the springtime. You made a point I wanted to go back to is uh, I think the most vulnerable, well, I, don't, I would think you would agree the most vulnerable time for our animals is from the time they're born to the time they're weaned. And I, and I feel like usually if an animal gets any sickness between that point, they're vulnerable for the rest of their lives to any of the things that we're talking about more so than the animals that didn't have any uh, pressures on their immune system. Not that they didn't have any, but you know, a, a sick fawn in zero to three months, usually for me is, is always a problem or always at a higher risk of, of yeah, I, being I, lost I, due to an extreme of one way or the other. I suspect that we could easily quantify that if we, if we looked and we just said, we just had a list of tag numbers of deer and you just said, you know, sickness. And then there was an, uh, a, a time range at the top of the page, you know, zero to six months, six to 12 months, whatever, all, all the way out through the life cycle at the, at the farm, you would see that the highest percentage starts in the left in the youngest animals and then slowly works down. And I think you would see a repetitive amount in the, um, in the animals that got sick earliest on down down the road, so I think you're right on that. Well, it appears that uh, we have a, a screen freeze. If you're watching on the video, um, I'm watching the video. He's back. He's back. Oh. Sorry, you locked <laughs> locked up there. Um, one of the um, one of I, I remember just chatting with you a couple weeks ago and you're like, yeah, I'm moving those does over. And I was pissed because like I, I shoveled out my man gates, but I didn't shovel out my big gates. And there was just, there was no way I had a similar situation where I have, you know, a group of does in a, in a pen. They, again, we have snow cover, but like, I just wanted to separate some out because I didn't want to have that many deer from a social stress standpoint. Um, not so much the pastures, but the deer themselves, you know, you put, put me in a room with whatever 15 other people in small, a small capacity for an extended period of time. And, you know, we're, we're all going to go to war with each other. That's just how it is. Um, so I, I, I ended up getting them moved here. They were, they were, um, they were, uh, one of the, one of the gates had less snow around it because of a tree. So I kind of dug it out and got them into another pen that I had open, which, you know, seven, seven less deer and, in one of the pens, I got scooted over and now they're, they're spaced out a little bit. Um, so I felt, I felt better about that, but yeah, no, there's, there's, and, and I, I think that I guess going back to the point about the, the, the bucks and the one and a half acre pen and the group of 30, the, you know, managing social stress is another part of, we'll call it management, but like you have this, this uh, social hierarchy that happens in pens, right? And then you have um, the physical uh, end of things where a body takes up a certain amount of ground and then there's, there's issues associated with that. 
Um, I think that social stress part is a, an, another aspect. I know in my conversations with uh, many people, I mean, I get to, uh, you know, as part of service solutions, I get to talk to a pile of people. And of course I get to talk about all their problems. You know, we try to identify what some of those things are. And uh, I'm not convinced that, you know, people's idea that, oh, we have an acre of, of ground, but I'm running 10 or 12 animals. They're all bottle fed, calm, and they're fine. I, I don't think that's the case. You know, I think, I think that number one exceeds the, the physical realm of what should be housed in that space. But I think that the social, the social stress that we are not seeing, oh yeah, they all, you know, they all lay together and they're all happy, right? They come up for treats every day. Yeah, okay. And then when you're not there and you're not looking, they're beating the snot out of each other or one doe's picking on the other one or pulling hair or getting on her back legs and pounding on them. I think those things happen um, regardless of how much time we, we spend together. You know, there's always a, there's always going to be a bully somewhere, right? Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. And I, and I to add to that, um, one, another aspect I look at is, is my feeders. Um, and, and again, I, good managers are probably listening to me and being like, you dumbass, of course, but you know, it, it, uh, I, I don't have exact measurements, but just through observations, I'm looking at, um, yeah, generally, even in, in a hunting preserve or a more wild situation, deer seem to feed at the same time. It isn't like this one decides to come up and he wants to feed. I mean, it, 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 yeah, I'm sure it occasionally happens, but generally speaking, the herd, whether it's a, it's a, a wild herd, a deer in a breeding pen or a hunting, you know, in a preserve, a big preserve, these deer are generally feeding at the same times as a whole. So if you, most of us watch, you know, if you're feeding in a, in a breeding pen situation, usually watch your deer come up at not, and whenever that time is that you're usually feeding, kind of do your health checks and all that. Well, I think the number of feeders that you have per animal, the the space per deer, per each feeder, and then also if you're noticing to your point the bullies, well this bully's coming up and over. You know you might have an eight eight foot long. You know I I, I use the uh, the tartar tartar brand. I have some tartar brand um, black you know the black troughs eight foot four footers, and I also have uh, uh, eight inch PVC pipe cut in half in generally all my pens but especially my buck pens that are eight foot long um but there's times when one animal is going to come up and take over that whole eight foot bunk feeder well yeah it might seem like you have enough room for those six or eight deer in there but in reality you might have enough space for per animal that you think's right but they're getting kicked off and then they got to wait till those those leave and they come and feed and they're probably not going to feed in my opinion as long as they would have as when they first came up because they want to go bed again just like the, the rest with the rest of their herd at the, at the approximate same time so you know in that situation i'll either put you know i generally had three to four feeders per pen you know even my even my half acre one acre uh you know fawn and doe pens um there's there's usually at least three feeders in there um and again size and amount of space and all that but uh, of the feeders but you know maybe you have two big feeders for the for most of the animals to come and then maybe 20 yards over on the left yeah you might have to walk you might have to do a little extra work or just carry that bucket over there and put half the bucket in a in a feeder that's 20 yards away from the main feeding area um same you know then i also move my feeders around but i think uh most of my feeders i have some stationary ones but uh the ability to add feeders add space for those deer so that when they come up to, to, to feed whether you're sitting back and watching with binoculars or you're right there with a calm breeding herd, um, you know that there's enough space that they're going to hopefully maximize the time at the feeder to be taken, you know, whatever the nutrition or the feed in. Um, I think a lot of times that's overlooked. Uh, it, 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 there's a pecking order and um, deer are going to, will take over feeders. In do you, in my uh, opinion. So do you like those, um, eight inch pvc feeders like you think that's probably the best all-around type of feeding for the price as far as pen, pen setup yeah yeah 
Yeah, I like him a lot. Yep. I uh, I've seen um. I've seen it all over. Specifically, I remember a, a rancher in Texas uh, had some metal ones welded, uh, and uh, that they're reportable or mobile. Mm. Um, mine right now, I have them mostly installed with. Uh, they're four um, Close. mailboxes. Yeah, like a little po metal thing you see to the four-inch post in, tighten it, and it holds it. Now, those are semi-mobile, but I still got to take the tractor in there, hook a chain, and pop it out of the ground and move it. I, I want to make them more mobile so I can, um, you know, move those every so often. Now, I'm not moving the other side of the pen, but, you know, I'll move them in a square, you know, maybe in a 50. Feet falling on the ground and hoof traffic and stuff like that. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if you, you know, you see guys with shelter, like I have some shelters and I'll put a feed bunk under there and it's like, well then extreme weather, you might get some animals to lay behind their shelters or under their shelters and uh, especially young animals, if they do that, well, that's where, to your point, especially in the wintertime, if your feeder's in there as well, well, they're pissing in there, they're crapping in there yeah. and, you know, it, it's build up of, of bad things. Um, I always wonder, I, I got these, uh, I got these Nelson waters, right? Well, 10 inch drinking bowl, 13 inch drinking bowl. And every once in a while I find a big old dump in there. And I'm like, you know, you have all this space away from it. Like, what do you like come up, get a drink, turn around, take a crap, and like some falls in there? I just I often wonder like, <laughs> how does this get in here? But it's uh it's okay. They're pretty easy to clean out. Um, I guess I'm I'm being hypocritical. But I only have, except for my bigger bu buck pens, I only have one water per pen. That kind of goes against what I just said about the feeders. But uh, I, I, I think there's a difference there. I just can't pinpoint what it is, or maybe I'm just making an excuse at the moment. Yeah, I think um, I think that could show a lot in the uh, in the summer. I know I have it. I have that in uh, in my my pens. You know, I just have one automatic water. I think in the summer though. Um, you know, if you have the ability to fill up a big drinking tub before, you know, at sunset, I, I, I'm an afternoon feeder, evening feeder, 90% of the year, unless I have something going on where I gotta dump some feed in the morning. But like, that's, that's my time. That's when I like to, you know, hang out with my animals and, and feed. And, uh, I think in the summer that, you know, it's cooler at night anyway, you know, you fill up a whatever 30 gallon tub. And uh, that adds an additional additional water source. Um, I had just while we're on water. So I had this, and, and if anybody's listening, you should build one of these. I don't know how you do it, but you should build one of these. Um, so we have, <laughs> we have, I'm trying to in, in, employ the, uh, the audience to come up with a, a cool idea. So how do you keep, um, how do you keep water in an automatic water cold in the summer right cool cool water in there because you know even even as it fills up like if it sits there for a couple hours and it's 90 degrees like it gets hot um and then an animal one animal's got to come up drink some hot water and then the cold water you know kicks over so i thought about this um this setup where you would have your your in your in water on one side and then there's a there's a like a four inch like a uh, trough so you have like a, a sidewalk and this is out of concrete or whatever could be made out of plastic or something like that but like a concrete uh form that comes up you know six inches on one side another six inches on the other side and then there's this this trough if you will or you could take a piece of six inch pvc cut it in half and lay it there and the water would come up on one side flow down the PVC, go 10 feet down into the ground, cycle over um, to the, the feed line and just run, right? And that way it would stay, it would stay cool. Um, it sounds like an expensive electric bill, but I, I bet you there's a way to figure out like what the capacity of pump that's needed to make that happen and have like a little solar panel there or maybe a small windmill or something like that. And that would keep cool, cool fresh water flowing all the time um you know and maybe maybe after you know so much flows on a regulator you know some's purged off or something like that or maybe it cycles down into a pond or i don't know um i thought that'd be cool to have 
fresh water. And, and then you, and then you do all that, and you have a rainstorm. They walk over and drink out of the puddle in the corner of your pen anyway. They just piss them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, there's nothing. There's nothing like um, you know watching animals interact, and you know you you spend you know five hundred dollars a ton on feed. And, you have these automatic waters and fresh spring water and all this stuff. And then, you know, one animal starts taking a piss and the other one walks up behind and starts drinking it. You're like, dude, yeah, seriously, we, we, we do this for a reason, but I guess, I guess generally speaking, uh, urine is, is pretty benign and, and neutral in nature. You know, uh, an issue I, I'm, I'm backtracking to your evening feeding regime. Yeah. Um, I generally in the same way, unless I have other things going on and, and takes me off schedule but i generally would like to feed in the evenings um hopefully by morning the kind of the when, I, I haven't been sticking to this but it goes to a, it goes to the point of bird issues oh. and does evening feeding when the majority of your feed is being consumed overnight early morning does it help and i don't know if it does but maybe it's just a, a simple management fix people can make if they're feeding in the morning and they have a bird problem uh, I'm not saying you can get rid of the bird problem completely, but can you decrease the amount of time them birds are on your feeders, around your feeders, if your deer are consuming the majority of their feed evening and overnight, um, and, and maybe forcing them to do that and get them on a pattern of eating mostly in the evening or at night. Um, this time of year, I, don't, I personally don't have much of a bird issue until things start freezing up around us. Um, I'm not in big, I'm not in immediately in big ag country where, you know, you got starlings and stuff everywhere. And just in many situations, I think it's unavoidable for guys, but is there ways to, uh, from, from just looking at feed, can you manage your feed feeding regime to, uh, lessen the impact of birds? Uh, if you think they're a problem. I've heard of guys covering their feeders up during the day. Yeah. And um, yeah. I don't know. So uh, I'll, I'll say this: I, I'm in I'm in the mountains. I'm I'm the largest ag producer around for you know ten miles or something like that. It's just we don't have a ton of bird problems. Although you know they'll they'll come in and whack a feeder or hit a you know hit a certain water or whatever that is. Um, I um. I don't plan on playing around with trying to adjust their feed schedules. What I've noticed is if the feeders are filled, not filled, but you know, the feeders have feed in them, those deer know that they can come up and, and get feed any time of day and they do that. So are, are we able to condition them to take in, you know, four pounds at night and then they just, eat pasture during the day and then they get their four pounds of grain at night i don't know but i know that like even in the summer my deer come up to the feeders <clears throat> you know if i feed at night and then come in and check in the morning um especially in the summer you know i don't in the winter i i don't do double i don't do double checks really not extensive double checks so just i don't see a reason for it a lot less activity um a lot less to go wrong anyway um, but in the summer, you know, I'm out checking ponds and just there's, you know, we got pens to mow off and there's all sorts of stuff to do. Um, my, my deer, you know, if I'm putting 20 pounds in a, in a pen, they're eating 10 pounds at night, I might clean the other 10 pounds up during the day. So sure. I'm not, I'm not putting that away, but I, I guess you could, I don't know how it would affect growth or, um, if you could do it or not. I don't, I don't know. I'm not up on that. I maybe, maybe somebody listening has done that or does that i'd be i'd be curious to find out more yeah, about yeah. That. that's a good point because in reality on my farm I'm, I'm usually looking at the next in 24 hours when i go to look at that feeder i like to have some crumbs that i know they didn't have to lick it clean but they ate, they ate most of it you know at that point um i just you see farms that i i, I know of guys who have farms where you got these swarms of hundreds of starlings or whatever mm -hmm. usually starlings the pieces of crap yep. but um it's usually starlings and there's hundreds if not thousands a group of a thousand at one farm just bouncing from feeder to feeder i mean you see it on you know we have a capital operation too our family does and you see it there too um 
I think it's a lot of it's unavoidable. It's may, maybe it's just a, a, a cleanliness, or maybe keeping your feeders clean and water as clean as much as you have time to do so. Yeah. Um, it's a good point. I don't know if you could condition them to, to do it, to, to achieve maximum nutrition with just feeding at night. Yeah. I don't know. If because I know. most pastures don't have the nutritional value in them that your feed's going to have, not even close in my opinion. Not, not when you're feeding, you know, four or $500 a ton. Yeah. Right. And, you know, we have, uh, it, at least here, the price of grain has been going up. Of course, the, um, I think most commodities are going up. Um, you can't, on a federal side, you can't uh, print money indefinitely and not have cost of goods go up. So that, let's keep it to deer. Okay. I, I will. <laughs> That's the only thing I was going to mention about the federal government. Um, but my, I know the last time I ordered feed, uh, I'm up 40, probably 40 bucks a ton, uh, just from the, the previous time. That was maybe, I don't know, two months ago. Um, I suspect this summer we're going to, we're going to start touching those high grain prices again. Um, okay. And, you know, when you start adding a hundred dollars a ton in a, a rolling 12 month time period, um, it, it can, it, it makes you, I guess, uneasy and you know, start looking for alternatives, but the cheapest thing you can do is, is feed a good, um, you know, a good quality. Uh, um, I'm just making notes as we're talking. I'm yeah, back I got my, little, uh, my little book <laughs> things I want to explore. But maybe for those who actually, who maybe might choose to listen to us ramble, um, is, uh, I think we're constantly, at least you and I, I know I am constantly trying to improve or think about, you know, my, my specifically my densities and the space available per my, for my deer and even more so now space avail available per season. Um, when you look at your, uh, your, your, your fawning pens, so where you're going to have your does, you know, whether they're there now or going to move into those pens, like say March or April, um, what kind of, what's your goal? I, I know you're kind of in a different situation right now, but with, with your herd and your numbers and all that, but, um, you know, when I look at right now, what I'm trying to do is have maximum of six breeding does per acre on my farm. I, I, I am going to have pens less than that this year, but I, I know I'm going to have one or two that I'm, I'm going to push that six on, but mm -hmm. they also are very low densities right now going through winter um, and maybe the fall where they didn't have a ton of pressure on them the, the fall and winter leading up to it. So I might push them a little more than I'd like to. So that's where I come up with my, my max is going to be six. Um, in a perfect world, I'd, I'd like to be probably four or five. Um, I guess I should pick one, but I, let's say five. For, yeah. for sake of discussion. Um, I think five is a good number. Um, each farm is obviously different. Um, yeah. The slope, the drainage, the, uh, the use, the whatever. But when you look at your fawning pens for does, kind of what, what's your density you're looking at? And what's your, what are, are you looking at the use of that pen the three, six, nine, 12 months prior to putting those does in? Uh, four. Lots four does per acre um and yeah i'm looking at those things and and that's more of a that's more of a recent revelation and looking at those animals and their their housing over over time um i've i've um i've cut back on my numbers a whole bunch and it's allowed me to reevaluate what we do and how we do it um one of the one of the things that I, I didn't know I was doing it at the time, but I, it just happened was um, how to evaluate pen densities and what is appropriate for your specific operation, your specific ground, a specific pen. You know, I have variations in my small little farm from pen to pen, what I know that I can and can't do. And we're only talking about an extra animal basically, um, but that extra animal is actually three animals. 
because uh, we're having fun, and we'll get to that in a second. But the um, developing carrying capacity uh, per pen basically goes something like this. Um, you put in the number of animals that you think you should have. And let's just say everything's equal. Let's just say it's we're working with round numbers. There's the pens are an acre. So you put 10 does in there because that's what you've always done. And you experience uh, you know, a 10% mortality up until weaning, but you've you've done um, something like a 30% morbidity where you're treating three out of every 10 fawns for some type of sickness over the, the summer. Um, you may be comfortable with your mortality. And I suspect that at 10 does, regardless of area, mortality is gonna be higher than 10%, morbidity is gonna be way more than that. Um, not Can I cut you off? But... Go ahead. You said 10% 10 10 mortality up until weaning. Correct. Now I, I would argue too, with that morbidity, Maybe you're heading there. I'm sorry, but yeah. as you get into up to one year of age, oh, it's going to change. That mortality is going to increase. It is due to that morbidity in many cases. Yes, I agree. And so, so the being able to understand what you're comfortable with, as far as how much sickness you want to deal with, how much death you want to deal with, um, everybody has a different um, appetite for that. For me. I, I don't want to treat animals. I'm just, I'm way over that. I used to have meds going into deer all the time. Oh yeah, we, we weaned 30 fawns. You know, 27 of those got antibiotics over the course of the first, you know, couple months of their life. I don't do that anymore. I just, the less meds that I have to grab, the better. Back to developing that carrying capacity though. Whatever that metric is, you have to come up with that. For me, what I did is I, I set a baseline and said, you know, I'm going to go with um, six animals and I'm going to see what that mortality morbidity looks like. And I want to be under a, you know, an X amount of percentage for those. Um, if I exceeded those, I dropped those numbers down to four. And then we did the experiment again, the next spawning season. And if I met those, then I would go up to five. And, you know, if I exceeded the, the percentages of mortality or morbidity that I want, I knew that that was a four, you know, a four capacity pen. So you can kind of set those again for whatever you want them to be. I, I don't want any mortality. I want all my fonts to live. So I'm shooting for zero. Um, and then as far as morbidity, I don't want to treat fonts. So I'm shooting for zero. And for me, that's four. That number is four, basically. Um, I have some pens that are a little under an acre that I can, I can run four in. And I have some pens that are a little over that I can run six in. Um, but if I, like last year, I had multiple pens that were an acre or so that I was running three in. And that was just because I, was, I didn't have animals but to, to fill them. And it was awesome. You know, we, we, in between, in between the 2020 fawning season and today, I lost one fawn from sickness and it was probably my fault. I, I could have done a better job at addressing what was going on quicker. That's a management thing. Yes, that animal got sick and died, but you know, I'll take, I'll take one mortality in nine months on, on my fawns. That's great. So yeah, I think I think um, quantifying what it is you want, and and we can get in. I, I had this conversation again many times with folks, getting into um, the number of fawns that you're weaning uh, uh, compared to the number of does that you have. So it's important, and and that comes to maximizing your your property and your space. So you want to get the most out of your ground with the least amount of input. Well, you can start assigning numbers to that. That's the easiest way to figure it out. You know, you got 10 acres of ground. Um, you're you're going to run X, Y, Z does. They're going to cost you X amount to feed. You have a certain number of deer that you want to get to as far as your fawns. 
you know, what does that look like? And the guy that has, you know, a hundred fawns and he's only weaning 50, well, I can wean 50 fawns too. And I might have half the number of does that you do. So my, my CapEx expense into that is way less than his. Oh, and by the way, because you lost those 50 fawns, I know that you have a $5,000 med bill. I didn't have that, right? So those are real conversations that you have to have and you have to have expectations. Then we come to the next point. Why is it that we run low numbers? Well, the carrying capacity of the ground is not necessarily four does, it's 12. Four does plus fawns, right? Two fawns each. So it might be okay for the month of June here in the North or May and June to have, you know, 10, 12, 15 pound fawns right here. Well, come August, when they're 40, 50, 60 pounds, they're different animals. Their input onto the ground is more. So it's important to, you know, factor that in. Okay, so your, 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 your ground capacity says that the number 12 is, is okay. You've, you've said, okay, that's, that's great. Well, that's in perfect conditions. Now we factor in extreme conditions. So what happens in the summer in, you know, July or August, and you have an event where you get 15 inches of rain or you get, um, you know, up here in the north, it's, it's not uncommon in August to get some, you know, colder nights or maybe in the early part of the season or you get these big temperature swings or whatever that is, um, or there's a, there's a drought. So looking at all those things and saying all these things factor in, this is the place I need to be in. I think those are important conversations to have with yourself. Um, it's not an, it's not a, maybe it is for certain people, but it's not an easy process to figure out. No. Um, because, I, it uh, out. I mean, it's not, that, that's my, that was my point. Um, yeah, no, it's so hard. what do you, what do you, what do you say? I guess I'm interviewing you now. What are the, you, what do you, what, it's a discussion. What do you, you'll know where I'm going with this because the recent something, but uh, what do you say to the guy who says, well, I, I can, I can double my, I can, I can double, I can do eight, eight does, 16 fawns, 24 animals in that same acre pen. All I have to do is put a certain amount of an antibiotic into my feed at a daily rate and my morbidity goes way down. What, what there's, there's, there's guys doing that in, in every agricultural sector uh, or livestock sector. Um, I, I, I'm not a fan of that. I think there's a cost. I think there's a, I think there's long-term uh, negative health impacts to the animal. Um, but what do you say to that? that that's, that's just another way of managing. I mean, it, can, it, it is. Yeah, it can be. And, and if, if you, um, if you're comfortable, if you're comfortable baking that um, cost association into your cost per animal, um, I guess that's, that's fine if you choose to do that. Um, the bigger thing for me is uh, long-term health of my animals. So ultimately, my goal is to have, <clears throat> um, is to have does with longevity and, and bucks with the potential for longevity, but early, you know, relatively early maturation for, for a white-tailed deer. Um, I'm not a fan of, and I, I think this goes to a, a public image. I'm not a fan of saying I have to feed antibiotics for my animals to be healthy. I think that's nonsense. I think that is a, um, a black eye on the industry as a whole. Look, these animals are raised in these types of conditions where they need to be fed certain antibiotics just to stay living. The question would be is, do you eat antibiotics every day? No, I certainly don't. I take probiotics in the morning. That makes me feel good. I take my vitamins, right? That makes me feel good. You know, I'm not, I'm not popping, you know, I don't know, cortisol or cortisone or something like that for my insides or whatever kind of drugs there are. Um, so I, I think that's, I think that's a, a public image thing that, 
the deer industry doesn't need. Um, I'm just not a, I'm not a fan. And I, I, we can go right into the pasture management setting where I get calls and guys are like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to spray my pens with, uh, uh, antimicrobials or bleach or I don't know, whatever. Okay, cool. You know, have I tried that? Yes, I have. Um, does it work? It's tough to say. I think that it has applications for certain areas. I do not think that you should be spraying it on your dough pens before you fawn. How about we make natural soil improvements? Yeah. Yeah. Right? I think I think the antibiotics, to your point, from a uh, public perception, it the it's such turmoil times with a divide on which side you're on. But I, I do think. Um, antibiotics are only only going to continue to be challenged by our legal process um, and the ability to use them. It's already happening. It's only going to continue. And, uh, and I think you're directly. seeing a movement as a whole. Yeah. And look to Europe. Public yes. Just look to Europe. The, and if you don't know about the, it, go just type in uh, antibiotic feeding or antibiotic use uh, Europe livestock. You'll, you'll figure it out. Um, another thing that we, from a public image perception, and now I'm going to actually uh, being outside of our industry, driving down the road, you see a cattle farm, it's managed well, you see this, and all of a sudden you come through deer pens, and at, at the densities we were referring to, but we've seen this, we both have, and um, there's certain times of the year where there, there's, there's animals standing in mud and that have to, and the only place they have to lay is where guys have been feeding them hay. Now I've seen on an, on multiple sectors of agriculture, not just, not just deer, this is not just a deer thing, yep. but a public perception. If your deer or your animals, I might piss some people off, but if your animals are standing in mud and the only place they have to lay is where you've been feeding them alfalfa, get rid of all of them. How about it? It's disgusting. Get rid of all of them. It's disgusting. You're not. Yes, exactly. I mean, so that gets into the density situation too, where um, the only way those animals would continue to be healthy is by feeding antibiotics, which just is a downward spiral spiral to what you're doing. Um, but I I'm just curious. I mean, I mean, guys do it, have done it. You know, there's a reason that you're able to market chicken breast for more money today because it says antibiotic free. It, it's, it's a, uh, a public thing it's a public perception coming down the line i just it um there's a place for antibiotics absolutely i'm not i'm not saying there's not um just a constant pounding of antibiotics into your animals i just you're uh in my opinion you're pushing them way too hard or you're doing many other things wrong that you could change to not have to do that um yes you might have less animals yes you might produce less um income producing animals than you thought you would when you began but you're also finding out that your farm is only capable of producing so many animals. You know? Yeah, um, I, I think that as, as an industry, we've done a poor job at telling people what that is, or at least putting that information out there. Um, I, I just, I've never, you know, when I, when I kind of got into this, I didn't have, you know, I just, there was no, there was no like resource for that. Like, Hey, these are kind of the parameters where you can work in. And, and like, well, of course there wasn't, wasn't podcasts in the nineties. Uh, not that, not that I know of, but like it just, those conversations didn't really happen. Um, of course, deer farming was, was different and we've, we've commercialized it in, in various aspects. Um, but we can, we can learn a lot from other places. Now it's just, it's, it's a matter of, I think, perception and, and how we want, um, how we want our industry to be looked at. You know, I try to, I try to do the best I can, um, as an example for, for others, um, to look at and say, and, and this is not to say that my farm is this special place, right? Like it's, it's a farm just like everybody else. It just, Try, I'm doing my best to employ different types of strategies to make it so it's a nice place to raise deer, you know, where the animals are healthy with the least amount of inputs and I can have a product that 
um, that I can sell that is, you, it's not necessarily organic, but it's, it's as close to the, we'll call it the natural, wild, whatever, white-tailed deer as I can make it. And, and that's, I control the inputs, right? So it's, it's something that I need to strive for. Um, and that's important to me. I, I, I want to have, um, I want to have my farm managed to the best of my ability and, and, you know, do, it sounds odd, but like do the least amount of work and get the most out of it. Right. 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 No, it's, makes not sense. Work, it's not the work that bothers me. Enjoy and, and as a whole, as a whole, um, I think our industry has, is moving in a great, in a really good direction. I'm right. not, this isn't like a huge problem. It's just, we've seen these problems. You and I have been in leadership where we had to been put in uncomfortable situations with whether it's legislators or this or whomever, the public to where you're put in a position to defend something that you don't want to defend. You can't you don't defend. believe in it. You, you don't believe exactly. You can't defend it. So it's just, that's, that those situations are less and less as we go. And I hope that yeah. continues. Yeah. Um, but like you said, our, our farms aren't these magical, perfect places. I'm not, I'm yeah. not saying that at all. We have our challenges. You have weather challenges. Sure. You have, you know, rain challenges. you have flooding, you have drought, all the things you talk about, those challenges exist. Um, just managing, try to manage to be set up the best you can be when those extreme conditions, you know, do come upon your farm sure. and, and hope you can handle it. Um, jumping back, uh, so when you go to that, uh, your four, your four fawns, yeah. I mean, four your four does, your eight fawns, now you're getting into August, September, whatever, whatever your weaning time process looks like, um, without going into detail of the process, we can do that as well. But are you, how are you, or I know you are, but like, are you looking at having empty space to put those wean fawns? Or are you looking to combine does and combine fawns? And then what are your densities looking like, say, from September through on, on those? I'm using doe fawns, but let's just say fawns in general. Um, from September through when you wean them, assuming roughly early fall, when you're weaning those, those fawns from that previous spring. And then you're going a full – are you going into winter? What, do you, what are your densities looking like then on those – those fonts because because there there is a you know you look at some cattle guys and they're looking at um uh weight you know weight per acre uh poundage per whatever word i'm looking for pounds per acre mm -hmm. um in, in some great region systems but uh obviously our fawns weigh less but still mm -hmm. how are you looking at that and, and what are you kind of setting for those animals is it still yeah. four or is it more four so, per acre or more? yeah so one of the i i I never realized I was doing this until, and it's so, so simple. Um, you know, you, you wean your buck fawns and you put them all in one pen, right? Okay. And you have an acre pen, it's got 21 buck fawns in it. And you end up having, you know, one or two get sick or one or two die or whatever, you know, the first month of weaning. And uh, what I've done is, I, if I have excessive numbers of animals, um, excessive. I'm listening, I got charged my phone now. Yeah, no, no problem. The, um, when I say excessive, um, exceeding a percentage of, or a number of animals per acre. So I'm not with weaned, with weaned fawns, I'm not uncomfortable um, with like eight to 10 per acre. Um, I think that's a pretty safe number. And if you come back to your comments about, excuse me, weight per acre, you know, a, a weaned fawn or a, a young, you know, a young fawn somewhere between uh, three and five uh, months old is going to be anywhere from, depending on the animals, 50%, 75% uh, of the weight of the mature animals. Um, you know, for us, it just depends on on the year that we're having and how many how many does that we're we're um, we're breeding and we're planning on cloning. But there's a there's certainly a transition that happens. Thanks for thanks for coming back on the video stream. 
Um, all right. Yeah, that's, I'm sure. It's all good. Um, there, there's this, there's this flow at the farm in the fall, where your, um, where your stockers go out, and that creates space. So we end up having separate, we end up having separate pastures for fawns in that transition period from, you know, let's just say August through October. And then as uh, space is freed up, does get sorted into breeding pens or, you know, AI pens or whatever we're doing that year. Um, those fawns will end up getting kind of integrated into, you know, a more mature setting. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. Which in turn is decrease in density as well. Um, it, it is, a, yeah, it is a little bit. There's, you know, I, I would say uh, I'm probably, I'm probably at five on my, uh, my bucks, five bucks per acre. Uh, maybe it just, it's going to depend on the year. I know. So like right now I have, I got, yep. I got five bucks on like three acres. There's like, you look at it, like, where's the deer, right? Um, and then I, I have, uh, I end up having like seven buck fawns on like three acres for right now. And again, there's, there's no animals. So they'll, they'll, um, you know, whether there's, whether there's seven yearlings on three acres or there's seven yearlings on two acres, it, it doesn't matter. And I can go either way, like, um, throughout their life cycle, but the biggest, the biggest thing that I've learned is, um, and I think this will, this will, I think this will resonate with you, is I always, for me, I always just took those buck fawns when I weaned and I put them all in one pen. And regardless of that pen size, I think that can be challenging and I'm going to contradict myself in a second, but I think that can be challenging. So you have four doe pens. They all have buck fawns in them. All those animals are separate. And you take, you take buck fawns from each one of those pens when they're weaned, and you put them all in one place. This, this, the stress from that is great. There also may be um, a bug that one pen has that they've dealt with, over the summer that is now being introduced in a communal environment to other pens that have not. And that's kind of where um, weaning, worming, or excuse me, vaccinating, worming, et cetera, comes into place and having whole herd management from a vaccine standpoint is important as opposed to just individual animals. Um, I know we kind of sidetracked off of there, but it's, the, the whole wean all your buck fawns and put them into one place and let them be, I think is something that needs evaluating. And I think that it would be better if you have the management and the space to um, potentially wean pens or wean a pen into one place, um, make sure you know your health protocols are all good and then integrate them into larger pasture over time. I, I like to, for the first, let's just say month to three post weaning. I like them in smaller pens so I can manage them easier. Um, you, know, you take buck fawns, you put them on, you know, if they go from one acre uh, fawning pens to three acre, um, you know, ra raising pens or rearing pens, um, and then try to get them out of there to get them into a barn to handle them or something like that. It, it's, it's hard um, or can be hard. You know, for me, I, I like them in a, a smaller, smaller environment so I can work them if I have to. Um, it just depends. It depends what, what we're doing, how we've had our, our weaning set up. You know, like we pre-wean, if I can, where I'll vaccinate prior to physical weaning and then uh, vaccinate again at physical separation at weaning time. And then I have to handle those animals again so I can... I can, like I said, I'm going to contradict myself. I can not put them in the small pens and I can put them back out into the big, big pastures. Does that answer your question? Or do you want? Yeah, I just want people to hear kind of your process. It's, it's, it's the, I've also have gotten away in the last, specifically the last two years. 
Um, I'm not as detailed with my weaning, I guess. If that's the way to put it. Or maybe I'm, but I, uh, I've basically been trying to, I, so right now I have one, I have four pens with fawns in from this previous year. Mm -hmm. And what generally I've been trying to do, and I need to really uh, figure out how I can improve on this process. And, and I think what it is, is <laughs> I seem to say this a lot lately, is more space mm. or less animals. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I have a little bit, I can, I can, in the next two years, I think I can make a little bit of improvements to have another two to three acres of space uh, with the same amount of animals is, is my goal. Um, to, to basically, I guess, I guess you call it fence line weaning is where I would, um, I have dividers between, say I have, say I have two pens of doves um, side by side and I have divider gates between those pens. They don't have to come out in the runway. They can just, I can just open it and allow them to just for a, a week or so to just move back and forth. And generally speaking, when I, if I want to open my runway, I guess you'd have to know my farm, but I can open a runway. My adults can come out, usually come out more than, more easily than my fawns because hey. they, my do those have been through this process. Sure. So they, they come out, they'll graze, just run up and down the runway and let them play. I'll close them out. And then I'll, uh, if I can, I might even leave them in there overnight if I have the ability to do that. Feed the fawns, just feed one pen where my fawns move over to that pen, put the does in the pen that is now empty, close the divider gates, and the does are right next to all their fawns where they can touch noses, be next to each other, all that. And then, then I leave, depending on densities, I leave those fawns in there till about February, March. Uh, no, not February, at least till March. And then I will separate and move them uh, into a, 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 especially my bucks, into that four or five acre uh, pen until, until they're released. Um, it seems to have worked well for me. Um, the, the only, again, the issues I run into is when I'm pushing, when I'm pushing above, above your, your 10 per acre is a good number. When I'm pushing above that, I'm oh, generally going to lose a farm. Yeah. Yes. I'm generally probably going to lose a couple of those farms yeah. through these harsh winter, these potentially extreme conditions we may face in the winter or change of conditions. But, um, I, I really like that. And I, and I was in a perfect world. I would, um, <laughs> have, have two acres separated into one acre pens. Let's just say for one doe group, those does, maybe I'd let them use both. I haven't figured this out. They'd have two acres for four or five does to have their fawns throughout the summer and then separate it to where those eight or 10 does have, or fawns have their eight. No, how did I have this? I was just saying this. A com no, it'd be, it'd be four does per acre to, to use your numbers. They have their eight fawns right next to them is an acre pen that's been vacant all summer long, or at least for a portion of the growing season this summer. Those fawns or does get moved over to that pen. You Probably the fawns would be ideal, a fresh pen. Uh, not as much pressure has been on it. Mm -hmm. And then and then they're weaned. Now, that takes that takes space. It takes a lot of space. It does. Um, but that'd be ideal. That, that'd be ideal. Um, I just don't know if, if – if, uh, I don't know if I need to get there. I should like to. I don't know if it's necessary. But um, it, it, it would be nice. <laughs> I, I, as I – you know, as I think about kind of my tenure in the deer industry, I keep thinking about <clears throat> my perceptions of it when I started and the reality of it and where I am at today. And I just, I'd love to, I'd love to have the ability to, you know, build a new operation. Um, I, you know, I keep, keep running through these things in my mind, like, Hey, it'd be nice. Like you're saying, like, Oh, it'd be nice to have another pen on the other side to, you know, pop these fawns over to it. Like you just never thought about that when you were setting up the first time, you know, and, and it's, um, it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things you learn over time that you didn't know. Um, but how could you, you know, there was just, again, yeah. these, res these resources weren't there. Um, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't, but a few guys, you know, back in the day that you could learn from and, and we still, we still see it today. You know, I, I've told, I don't know how many people 
don't build your pen with four by fours. And what do they do? I see stinking four by fours for line posts. Well, those things are going to break. You know, they're not, they're not meant for any longevity. Do they have a place on a farm? Yeah, you can use them for some stuff. Fence posts isn't one of them. You know, you're not going to get any longevity. You spend, you spend all this money on, you know, 30 year or 50 year fence. And then you put a five year pole in. <laughs> what the hell is that? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Now, with that said, you wouldn't know that 20 years ago. You know, nobody would have told you. There was no, no it's, like, it's, it's, it's just crazy. It's, you know, we, again, there's guys been in this, in this you, you've been in it longer than I have, and there's guys been in it twice as long as we have combined, probably, you know, in some, in some instances. Um, I think go to a lot of those guys. If you're, if, I guess I'm talking to the person thinking about starting a farm or, mm -hmm. It, it, it has started very small and wants to expand. Um, you hear the question, or you see the question here, it depends if we're at an event or it depends if it's, it's on social media somewhere. Um, I want to raise some deer, how many pens should I have? Um, it, it <laughs> from what my experience, I would just say do more than, do add two more than what you're thinking or add a couple more than what you're thinking because generally what I hear people say, and you correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just going off from memory of listening to, to some things it's well you should have three pens you should have a pen for your does a pen for your doe fawns and a pen for your bucks and you can mix your bucks in age groups if you have to um hearing that starting out it's like oh okay great i can i can have six does and you know in this in, in a one acre pen and i have another eight. all of a sudden you're two two and a half three or you're three years into this and you have way too many deer i think that's the most Thanks, common theme of our of, of of people getting started at least up here in the north. I'm I'm not familiar yeah. with Texas in the south. They've been doing this a lot longer than we have up north, as far as the amount of people doing it. Um, but uh, you just you can't have enough space, in my opinion. And I know what that space is, and know what you're. You know, if you only have three acres to work with, come talk to a lot of guys and come to the reality of what that means for the amount of animals you're going to be able to, to a, good, a good analogy is you know you're shopping for a gun safe right and you're like oh i'm gonna buy a 12 gun safe it's like dude you're gonna buy four more of those before the time is done go buy the 48 or the 64 because you're gonna keep putting guns in it right like yes that's that's the yep. same thing with deer farming just if, right. if you're gonna do it if you got you know 30 acres of understand your restrictions that, that's exactly right and then you got to be you got to be real about it you got to be real about yeah. it. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to end up with, you know, 30 deer on a, on an acre and it's just it's not going to work out well for you long term. But um I uh I got a meeting I got to hop into here. We've been chatting for a while, so I'm going to I'm going to wrap up the show. I'm sure uh I'm sure uh there was some interesting tidbits from from one of us that uh that the folks will like and or not. We'll, uh, we'll <laughs> We'll do it again here soon, I hope. So. Yeah, man, I'm up for it. It's fun. Right, it's fun having just discussions. It's especially, you know, I don't do trade shows much anymore. And I think generally it's less people do them. I'm not saying it's a good thing. It's, it's, uh, we don't know, if, like Nadifa, I think I just heard is going to be virtual this year. Yes. And while we have other conversations for sure, these are some of those conversations I think happen between individuals, um, whether it's just bullshitting about whatever. Um, it's nice to have it. It's just nice. To That's why we call it North America. And even me, it's nice to listen to. It's nice to, when you have other guests on. It's just nice to listen to. I don't care what the subject is, yeah. as long as you're just take some ideas. I mean, I don't know if we gave anybody anything to think about, but especially the younger, newer farmers, it's it's good to uh, at least hear people talk about stuff. We don't have yeah. enough of it. I in got our some stuff in my in my notes that um, I need to I need to to think on more. So I got something from it. And that's uh, that. Yeah, something. I did too matters to me so i appreciate it right, man. We'll, we'll we'll wrap up and uh stay tuned for another episode of north american deer talk